Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, and as always, I'm joined by Jay Gilbert. How you doing today, Jay? Great, Michael. You look a little different. Different headset today. Yeah, a little <laughs> technical difficulty, but uh, we'll get it straightened out. The show goes on, right? So much your, go on. Your, your roadie ran out, swapped out the gear right in, yep. in mid-recording. You know, like any true professional, I have two of everything. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Just hopefully one of the other ones works, right? <laughs> right. So we um, we have a special guest today. I'm going to let you do the honors of introducing our guest and kicking things yeah. off here. Yeah, today we have Keith Bernstein, and, and uh, Keith has a, a great experience. Um, I worked with him at Universal. Before that, he was at a and We worked together in the Electronic Commerce and Advanced Technology Group slash global e whatever they were calling it at the time but it was a it was a new thing at the time and it was a, a great area for us to uh, work together in. it was kind of the early stages of digital when the uh, original napster uh launched back in those days um keith is uh, ceo of royalty review council and he has his own company called crunch digital and i'll let him t- talk a little bit about those but keith welcome to the show Thanks for having me, and nice to see you after so many years. So, so the first big question is, and I don't know if everybody in the recording is going to see this. Clearly, if you're listening to audio, you won't. Jerry's Restaurant and Deli in the background. Explain oh. what that's doing on the wall. All right, well, we should stop now. <laughs> <laughs> what is that on the wall? Um, that is actually um, a gift that was given to me that came out of UCLA's Pauley Pavilion. Um, Before uh, they changed the signage and redid UCLA's Pauley Pavilion, Jerry's was an advertiser. And you know, Jerry's, the colors are red and white. Well, allegedly UCLA wouldn't allow the red into the uh, the, uh, stadium because it's all about yellow and blue. And that's USC's colors, right? USC's colors. So they put this in there. And um, when it got removed, they gave it to uh, uh, the folks at Jerry's and Westwood. And before they did that, uh, all the players back in the uh, Final Four team of 2008, I think, uh, signed it. And then on my birthday and around the same time Jerry's Westwood closed, they said, what are we going to do with this? And they said, well, Keith's a huge fan. Give it to him. So that's how I ended up with it. That's very cool. Very cool piece of memorabilia. Nice. Yeah, we could just talk UCLA sports, which is a lot more, <laughs> it's a lot more interesting than what's happening maybe in royalties because it's, you know, I've told Jay, it's not like I wake up in the morning, stretch my arms and say, let's get into royalties, you know, it's, uh, right, right. So anyway, well, but uh, well, thanks for noticing. tell us a little about it. Um, you know, Keith, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you kind of got to the, uh, you know, Royalty Review Council and Crunch Digital and kind of t- tell us how you, uh, you know, how that path kind of came about. Um, well, I got into royalties at AM Records in, around 1990 because I was told that I was not very creative, and if I wanted to be in the music, and if I wanted to be in the music <laughs> space, you know, I had to. Uh, you know, Basically, if you didn't want to lose your job, you're going to go over here and do this, right? Yeah, I was excited. I was working at AM Records, and you know, I thought this is going to be fun. And then it didn't take long before they said you're 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 better suited for business affairs and, and royalties. So. That's where how I ended up, but you know, through the years, I kind of became the guy who understood the flow of money, uh, you know, worldwide, uh, you know, when it related to physical goods, and um, and it really, you know, became an area that was, uh, you know, I became a specialist in it, and really got to understand copyrights, copyright law, and um, between the A and M and then the Universal acquisition, and you know, somewhere along the line, Seagram's or Vendi were bought us as well. Uh, I knew there was a need in the marketplace, um, especially when I was working on the uh, P&D deals uh, over at uh, A&M, that you send statements to uh, independent record labels, and then you kind of wonder, like, so how are they getting the royalties done? You know, who's, who's doing royalties? So I knew there was a business opportunity to launch a company that would be the back office for independent record labels back in 99, and that's why I launched Royalty Review Council. And, you know, we also got involved uh, around 2003 into audits of digital services um, because that's when digital came around and I had a lot of insight on digital. Um, we kind of blended procedures to look at, um, you know, new, new service companies without naming names. Uh, I mean, one name I could mention is the uh, 
on for sound exchange we've been doing audits of uh webcasters on their behalf uh for, i think for over 10 years but along the way a few years ago in conducting our audits um, it became very apparent to me that sometimes a lot of the findings we had was because the services that we were auditing really just underestimated what was involved to get the reporting done. Uh, and some of them weren't doing something, you know, inappropriate and trying not to pay. They simply couldn't get it done, couldn't handle the reporting. It was a lot of work. And thus came the idea of Crunch Digital, which is where I'm spending a lot of my time these days. Um, and so Crunch is a company whereby, you know, that is now acting like a back office, like when we launched Growth Review Council on behalf of multi-channel networks, music apps, uh, digital services. And we can get into more of that later, but that's kind of the progression. Uh, you know, I've been doing it now for almost about 25 years. And like I said, I haven't, you know, it's not like it's that interesting. We're just good at what we do. Well, you know, and, and as much as you said royalties may not be, the excite as exciting as like Jerry's Deli, um, right. it sure is the hot topic recently in in music industry news. I mean, it's just every week there's somebody else saying, "I'm not getting paid enough. I don't get paid what I should get paid." Um, it, it seems like that's coming out more and more every week. Well, just yesterday. Um, we were chatting and letting folks know that we see that there might be a problem, not to get into the, the granularity of it, but Section 115 for streaming royalties looks like it might have a problem that was unintended. Um, and, and going into, Michael, to what you're saying, uh, here's a case where publishers thought they were going to participate on a certain pool of royalties uh, from music subscription services. And my take on it is that I don't think they are. They're not getting what they thought. Um, just in a nutshell, a lot of the streaming royalties uh, for music subscription services was there was going to be this pool of money. And this pool of money is going to be made up of both cash and non-cash consideration given to record labels. Um, the intent was it would include a pot of maybe uh, equity or advertising credits, whatever it is, goes into the pot. And then the publishers are paid a percentage of that pot after deducting a performance royalty. But when you get into the details of the regulations, you find that you don't have to put anything in that pot if you're a music service unless you've actually expensed those items that we just talked about. And from talking to some uh, accounting folks at some of the uh, big accounting firms, they're telling me you don't have to expense those items. So if you don't expense it, it means the digital services don't have to put them in the pot and therefore the publishers are probably not participating on all that upside they thought they would have. So this is a big issue that I think is going to break right now that will be another area where publishers will say, where's the money? Well, let's step back just a little bit, Keith. I mean, what do you attribute the, the decreases in royalty payouts in general? What do you, what do you attribute that to? The decreases in royalty payouts? Well, yeah. I think that, um, and I've said this before in the past, that, you know, the concerns are always about piracy and that because of piracy, you know, you are not collecting as much as you would have liked. But, you know, I've kind of gone the path of it's not really just about piracy. You can't even collect all the money from the people you've licensed. And then that's where the shortfalls are because, you know, the rumors are out there and there have been some press uh, recently that there's tens of millions. And I think there was even one article that said over a hundred million dollars sitting at uh, digital music services where they can't identify who to pay. Wow. Now, is, and, is, 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 that, is that attributable to the fact that there's poor metadata to say who, who, who this stream, the rights owner, who's the rights owner of this song? Um, well, if you take a step back, uh, the answer is uh, yes, but let's just look at this for a moment. If you're a service, I guess the question is, should you even be using the music yet if you, if you don't even know who to pay? So if they knew who to pay before they used the music, I suppose there wouldn't be a problem of all these unknowns. But the, the issue is the music's getting used without really, you know, uh, knowing who to pay to begin with. So that's well, where it starts. Yeah, but, I mean, but, sometimes it's a lot easier to ask for, you know, forgiveness than permission, right? Um, 
Well, you know, under Section 115 uh, for compulsory licensing, uh, you know, many digital services operate under those licenses and, and they send out uh, these notices of intent. Um, but in many cases, they don't send out the notices of intent and the music still gets used. And the problem is under Section 115, there's no audit rate. So if there's no audit rate, you can't even go in to figure out if you're not even getting paid. And it just seems like a lot of services use the music and then try to do the best they can to get people paid when they can figure out who to pay. But the problem is, is uh, it sounds like, a lot of, sounds like a lot of folks just aren't finding who to pay and the money's stacking up. You know, it, it's, it's, it is fine to say that a streaming service shouldn't ideally play music if they don't know who to pay. But if you step back even further, shouldn't the rights holder not be releasing the music out to a streaming service if they don't have the proper information to say this is who you need to pay? I mean, somebody's got to be get, somebody's providing that music to the service. Um, well, I think you're assuming that the uh, owner of that music gave it to them, and that's not always the case. You know, the services I'm sure could obtain the music that they want to distribute from anywhere, such as ripping CDs, um, buying tens of thousands of CDs, and and putting the audio okay. files on the service. Yeah, and end users like me, I could upload things to certain services without an aggregator like a TuneCore or an Orchard or something like that. Some of those services allow that. And then you run into other issues such as compilations, where I've seen it whereby uh, somebody might submit a compilation album to a digital service because they, in fact, were the ones who had the rights to the compilation. But then what happens is, is the service breaks down the compilation into singles, which was never intended with the rights that were given right. to the compilation. And then the payments for those singles actually go to the people who released the compilation, so they don't even make it to the right folks unless they're reporting back to them. Interesting. How how much of what what you're what you're discussing right now is attributable to it just being such a brand new, ever evolving business that people didn't foresee this stuff when they got into it, and how much of it is, I don't know, malicious is is with intent. Um. Well, it's a little early in the morning to remember everything you just. <laughs> But let me let me let me, let me, let me see if I can answer those questions. We'll we'll break them down. Um, the I believe that the uh, Section One Fifteen licenses are are kind of used as an umbrella of protection by certain digital services, where they feel that you know they can just operate their business and say they're operating under these licenses and just do it. Um, and and sometimes they're not even following the rules for the reporting on these uh, Section 115 licenses. One of them uh, in particular is, I believe um, you have to make the license request, somebody might correct me, but you have to make the license request at least 30 days before the music is even on the service. And I don't think that's happened. And I think the music gets used on the service and then the uh, license gets sent out. And then technically you have an invalid uh, license to begin with. So if they don't even have the rights, you already have a problem. Um, what was one of your other questions? What was, what was one of the other questions? Well, it, it was just basically how much of this is due to not understanding this new digital realm, digital streaming, where where people were were moving from a physical world, a way business operated for decades, to overnight digital, versus people who are like, we're going to game this system. We're 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 taking advantage of these loopholes. I think it's a combination. Um, I, I think you have companies out there that are basically operating behind the guise of a defective, you know, uh, compulsory license. And I think that there's, a, those, there's those out there who I've talked to who've tried to get it done the right way. But what they tell me is, at least in the U.S., when it comes to the publishing side, it's not so easy to license music because it's so fragmented. And then out of frustration, I think some of them, especially in the music app world, go ahead and release their product knowing they don't even have the licenses, hoping that they can build some traction and a user base, and then they'll get noticed, and then somebody off to the side, you know, a venture capital, somebody will say, wow, look at all the traction you've got. Okay, I'm going to write you a check. You're going to have some money to further develop, and now we're going to take that money, and we're going to go over to the publishers and labels and try to issue an advance so that we'll settle the past and get a, and get a go-forward license. I'm seeing that a lot more now because I believe a lot of the music apps, especially in that area that I've been working, um, feel that it's just too hard for them 
to go out and try to get licenses from everybody and that they'll be found if they're popular. Is there one central source? If you were to start a music app today, is there one central source that you can go to to obtain all these, uh, like a blanket license? In the U.S., no. I mean, that's, that's been, you know, uh, a discussion for quite a while to build a global rights database. And there was one that had been attempted a, a number of years ago um, out of the U.K., I think, but, you know, my take on, on when you build a global rights database is that when you have, you know, uh, participants who have uh, an interest in it all trying to build the database together, that you're likely to find that they're not going to get along, they're going to see things differently on how it should be built. And then they typically fall apart when the discussion comes up is who's going to pay for it. Then they just scatter and they don't, it doesn't actually get built. Um, but you need the global rights database. But the thing that's important to note about a global rights database is that even if you can find you know, who to get a license from, uh, the discussions I've seen for Global Rights Database, they stop right at, you know, okay, so I found you, but how does this ensure that somebody's going to get paid? It, it, it doesn't go that far. Who's, this might be just such a, sim, uh, a too basic of a question, but whose responsibility is it to fix this? The silence is me trying to think what to say. But, uh, <laughs> whose responsibility is it? Well, I think that there's been talk that the copyright office should maybe create its own database where folks can go there and do lookups and figure out who to get a license from. I've, I've seen that come up. Um, I've taken the position on this that it has to be a private company. Uh, that's something that Crunch Digital has been focused on for the last uh, four years, which we've been doing and building a database whereby, you know, and for us, and this isn't an infomercial, but for us, it's going to take someone like us, uh, you know, that is independent, private, and doesn't have, you know, uh, they're not connected to a trade organization, they're not part of a performing rights organization, you're, you're completely clean. And in the middle, middle, building the rights database where folks can come to and look to see, you know, who they have to license from and also do the reporting through. So whether it's us or it's three companies like us, you know, it's going to take something like that where people can just go to and say, if I work with one of these authorized third parties, I'm good. Got it. Who are your clients, Keith? I mean, are they uh, artists, managers, labels, music app? Uh, providers? Who, who are your main clients? Well, our focus lately has been on uh, multi-channel networks on YouTube as yeah, well. Yeah, give us an example of, you know, for those that are listening and, and watching that aren't familiar with multi-channel networks, talk a little bit about what that means. Um, essentially, a network, uh, as I understand it, there's you know, YouTube proper, and then there's these channels. And in the channels, uh, a company like Fullscreen, who was a client at one time, um, would upload their own content, and then that content might contain music elements. And for what they hired us to do with respect to reporting back to publishers, we would do the reporting back to those publishers based upon um, the uh, views on their channel that contained uh, music in the videos. Because as I understood it at the time, and I still think it's the same way, on YouTube, if you're one of these channels, I think they now call it a managed channel, uh, those companies uh, have de direct deals, I believe, with record labels and publishers, and they pay them direct, as opposed to being in YouTube proper, where when it goes through a YouTube system, they pay the labels and the publishers. So we help companies that are not going through YouTube proper, who have their own direct licenses and have to do the reporting. And then on the music apps, um, you know, I mean, music apps, uh, and I love working with those guys because they have fantastic ideas and they have these, you know, wonderful ways of promoting and distribution, and many of which are always new when you start talking with them, and there might not have been a prior licensing outline that even fits it. And that's why sometimes it takes some time to get those folks licensed. But the music apps, you know, they didn't start off with, I'm going to launch this music app and I'm going to uh, allocate all these resources that to be in a back office royalty reporting system that's not in the business plan and that's where we come in um, and these music and these music apps will use us to handle uh, you know facilitate licensing and reporting on their behalf yeah, yeah I, I've, I've I've always felt especially when you're talking about music apps um, new emerging websites a lot of what you're dealing with are 
developers who have an amazing idea about some new way, some new music technology, and they develop it. And as you said, they never thought about what the back end responsibilities are for doing this. They just got this killer idea. Mm -hmm. They build the killer idea. Then somebody comes knocking on their door to say, you can't do that killer idea. You don't have the rights. Uh, until you start acquiring rights or paying. One thing I suggested, you know, maybe in some sort of incubator setting for music apps would be if somehow, whether it's publishers or labels or others, maybe got together with some of these smart people building the apps and tell them, you know, let's guide you on the areas that we know that will work for us and are probably going to be great for you. Because what you don't want to see happen is they build this great app that's really cool and then they demo it for somebody at a label and pub a label or publisher, and they say, "This is fantastic, but you know, I can't even license you the rights for that type of use because I don't even have the rights to give it to you." And then they got to go back and, and redo things. And then when they're redoing things, they're probably having to go back to the people that gave the money, and they say, "Hey, sorry, we spent all this money on this, but we're finding out that we can't actually include all these elements. We got to redo it." So, what I think would be great if it is somebody had would start a group that would just huddle with all these developers and tell them what they all think, what will or won't work. And maybe that will help to get things to market faster that are licensed. Yeah. Have, have you worked at all with um, say artists or managers? Um, have they brought you on board to go in and do some kind of, I don't know, forensic accounting for a lack of a better term to see if they were being paid what they were supposed to be paid or is, you know what I mean? Have you ever done anything like that? Well, I mean, in our audit practice, we do it for, you know, large digital services on behalf of major labels and major publishers. But so far, I haven't seen anybody talk about, you know, conducting an examination of an app, uh, a music app. I mean, you have to look at the commercial relevance and yeah. decide whether or not, you know, is there mo enough money here right now? And frankly, you know, there's another music app popping up. Every there's probably two created while we're on this, uh, right. on this conversation. <laughs> yeah. And and, and and the thing is, is there's so many of them, you can't police all of them. And that's why I've been, you know, out there promoting that what you really need to do is maybe even require some of the music apps to work with an authorized third party, you know, like a Crunch Digital, um, not just to force them to do it because you don't trust them, but really because, again, you know, they underestimate what's involved with the reporting. And if a third party is doing the reporting, then maybe you don't even have to do the audits because the publisher's labels will feel like it's getting done by somebody who knows how to get it right and the reporting's getting sent over with the money and everybody can feel good about it and then there's no need to do an audit. Interesting. I'm just trying to wrap my head around, and I think the idea is great to have like an industry group that's available to mentor or educate these development teams because a lot of these development teams don't come from the music industry. So they don't have any back-end history to understand how the music business works. Right. And they're getting VC funds probably from people who also don't understand the music industry. They just look at something and go, that seems like a great business model. You've got a user base. Um, we want to invest in it. How do you cut, how do you stop it before it goes too far? You know, how do you, how, how do you educate a VC to say, you know what? don't invest until they've got their ducks in a row or don't start coding that don't don't make the pitch to a, a major record label like you said who's going to go i don't have the rights or worse is going to say um if that shows up in the app store we're going to sue you you know stuff like that how do you prevent that from getting too far down the road well, I think right now that um, some of these apps don't even have those conversations with the VCs until they even have the traction. So they're kind of already out of the gate testing their product, maybe using music that they shouldn't be using. Um, and when they get to the VC, um, you're, you're right. Uh, you know, some of these VCs, I think, do get involved and, and sometimes things go, you know, they get derailed because they don't have the licensing. So I guess the question is, how do you educate the VCs? Before they, uh... I mean, yeah, because if, if you're looking at an app survives on investment funds, you know, you can have a great idea, but if you don't have the money to make that idea reality, it's going to go nowhere. So educate the source of the funds to say, stop, before I put any money into this idea, 
I need you guys to deliver X, Y, and Z to prove that this is viable and legal. I think that maybe what you're suggesting is that these apps go to the labels and publishers somehow and um, get their guidance of what's going to work and not work and that they're blessing if they follow certain rules that, you know, they'll get the licenses. You yeah, know, I'm really not sure. Yeah. What's that? At least somebody who could, you know, advise them because I'm a firm believer that it's a healthy thing for our business to have people developing apps that are outside of the industry, whether it's a Shazam type thing or what, whatever it is, I think that they're going to think of things that maybe people in the music industry might give up on thinking, well, that'd be too difficult to get rights or that might be too difficult. Somebody from the outside is just looking at a great idea and wanting to implement it. But I think to Michael's point, it'd be great if they had you know, a source, uh, a place where they could go early on and say, this is my idea, and it could be under NDA, you know, this, this is my idea, this is what I'm looking for funding for, what are the things, you know, you, you know, expert, that I'm going to have to think about, whether it's, you know, licensing, royalties, permissions, those sorts of things. I, I don't think it really exists. I mean, I think what you're talking about is almost like an agent, um, you know, an agent for music apps who can yeah. help guide them and then can and basically can make their phone calls to whoever they want to make the phone calls to and say, look, I'm thinking of this. I'm thinking of doing this for the client. They want to use it this way. It's U.S. It's non-U.S. And yeah. they have to get the feedback from the publishers and labels. And they say, okay. And then that, that agent maybe goes to the VCs as part of the process and says, you know, look, you know, this is the path they need to follow. And I think if they follow it, all is going to be good. But yeah. I just think in practice, it's not going to necessarily work because you, you just don't know which developer is going to come up with the next great thing who's sitting in the dorm room doing something really right. cool. It's happening then, right now. And, and it's, yeah, you know, we're probably up to four new apps now in our conversation <laughs> right. that have come out since we started this. Yeah. But, but, but the truth is, I, I really think, or not the truth is, but I really, I believe the reality is that, you know, the VCs don't give attention you know, to an app or any other service until they see that commercial traction. And, you know, and getting that commercial traction means making it cool and wanting everybody to use it. And if, everybody, and if everybody's using it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's been licensed. Um, so I really think that when you're at the VC level, you know, should you put money behind a, a company that's already um, out there and they know that they haven't licensed music? I think it's just going to be up to that VC, you know, if they feel good about the fact that they can rely on having a bunch of money and that's going to take care of uh, the sins of the past by not having a license. Is it I really that difficult, Keith? I mean, is it really that difficult for a company to obtain proper licenses? In the U.S., uh, I, you know, my take is it's a lot more difficult than outside the U.S. because in the U.S., you know, again, you don't have one place you can go to to uh, do your clearance, whether it be sync, you know, or mechanical, whereas outside the U.S., you have the societies where you can go clear things. But in the U.S., which is the launching pad for a lot of these popular apps, um, it's not just the difficulty of the licensing um, you know, and trying to find who to go get your deal uh, with based upon the music you want to use, you have to appreciate that at the publishers and the labels, you know, they have a limitation on resources as well. So people forget, you know, that when you come to a publisher and they might have, you know, 50 deals sitting on their desk that all came in within the last three weeks, they have to get through them themselves. They have to evaluate them. They got to make sure that this is something that, you know, they feel good about. Um, then they have the internal cost of the paperwork that they've got to do and go back and forth with redline versions of it. So if you're an app coming to somebody, it's probably really hard to get up to the top of the queue to get reviewed. And then now a month goes by or two months go by. And it's no fault of the labels and publishers because now you've got this world of, of accesses everywhere. It used to be a couple deals would come in a month, you know, a few years back. But now it's like they must have inboxes that are getting stuffed and they just can't get to all of it. So the licensing difficulty is not because publishers and labels don't necessarily want to license somebody and they want to make it difficult. You know, there's resource limitations, I believe, to even get to all sense. the opportunities that are coming through. 
Yeah. And then I've talked to apps who feel like they haven't got to the top of the queue. So they're just going to go ahead and do it anyway. They're going to launch. They're going to use music. They're going to show people this is a great product. And then maybe that'll get the attention of somebody who's willing to, uh, like we said at the top of the call, willing to say, okay, you're a good app. Let's get the license done. You got to pay me for the past. And I'll give you a, a go forward license. So it's not just the, it's not just the difficulty in the licensing rights. It's people never seem to talk about, you know, how much work it is on the labels and publishers to even get through all the deals that are coming to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. L l let me ask you out of curiosity. I'm launching. I want to launch a new um, streaming service. This is a, a what if. Um, I'm dealing with trying to get the license, but as you said, it might take a year, two years to get through all this just because of the back and forth, the wait, the, the resources, whatever. I don't want to wait. And I'm also not going to go out and get a million CDs and rip them. How do you acquire all those digital files to stream them if, if, if you're not going to rip them yourself? Um don't fully know the answer on that one except that there are companies out there uh, who already have the audio files uh, aggregators who you can go to and they will be your back-end uh, fulfillment there's probably at least three or four or five out there right now where you know you can have an app or a music subscription service and simply uh, contact these folks that say when someone searches for this song uh, deliver it to them wouldn't it so wouldn't it, it seems like then it would make sense that that aggregator should be responsible to say, I'm not delivering it to you if you can't produce a license. I would agree. And I don't know what their uh, policies and protocols are to review what licenses are in place. I don't, you know, that's beyond me in terms of uh, what somebody's telling them they have in place. And, and I don't know necessarily if it's a requirement on their end to have to check if they're being engaged True. by somebody that says, you know, I'm paying you to do this, do it. It's just, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of there's so many on-ramps to this highway. And, and you want to try and, you know, trying to stop, stop what's happening once you're in the middle of the highway going 70 miles an hour is tough. It's better to put the stoplight at the on-ramp and go, wait a second, you can't even get on until you can show you've got a driver's license type of thing. And, and there's yeah. just so many of those, those little channels where I guess people can get around what's happening and they can get into the system. Well, I had an idea that was way out there that I put you know, forth, I don't know, about a year ago. My idea was that if you want to start a digital service that – you agree to, let's say, register yourself, your company, whatever it might be, with Librarian of Congress that gives you a license to perform, to have a company that does X, you know, an interactive subscription service, and that you would not then need to go to labels and publishers for all the licensing, that you agree to pay this certain rate, and you can use all the music you want and start tomorrow. And as part of doing it, that um, by signing up with the uh, Librarian of Congress, you're agreeing to, I can be audited, my books and records are wide open to you, and this is the limitation of my services. And then you would give labels and publishers the opportunity to say, you know, it's okay if they, if they do such a thing as long as there's a mechanism where we can choose to opt out and not include our music which then would still create a problem because somebody's not going to exactly know which tracks go with who with whatever company opts out. So I've been thinking about how do you make it faster? I mean, if you look at the sound exchange model, mm -hmm. um, this is great because if you're a webcaster, you can go to one place who mm -hmm. represents all these record labels and you get your license and you're a webcaster effectively tomorrow. Um, I think the sound exchange model, uh, which is very efficient, is something that needs to be looked at as maybe something for other types of uses as well. Are you guys are you guys broadcasting live? Someone's calling asking me about this. No, so. yeah. <laughs> no, no, this isn't live. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, 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 business. Yeah. But I think that it's gonna take really going wild in terms of thinking outside the box. And I think that a solution like I described is is very possible, provided that you know everybody buys in to uh, such a concept, the digital services, the labels, and the publishers. But it's really hard to get so many people all on the same page. 
Ken, do you do you think the industry itself can solve this, or is it going to take government involvement? Hmm. Uh, I think it's. I think the industry should solve it on its own. I think that's a better option, and I think a private solution is a better option. Um, and let the government, you know, be the rate setting folks for where they're where it's needed. But I think overall it'd be much better to let the market and the uh, labels and publishers come up with their own solution. You had mentioned, Keith, that s some, some companies can't be audited, right? Um, certain licenses can't be audited. So yeah, if you can, can you, can you explain that? I, I, I can't. That? Actually, I can't. I don't know why there's no audit, right? You know, <laughs> so I can't. I can't say anything that's com You know that 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 explains this, Jay. Because um, when you think about it, when when you license somebody your rights, you should be entitled to confirm the accuracy of what you got. One would but, think. And, but in the Section 115 compulsory licenses, you have to rely on the kindness of strangers to give you a straight count. And it's, it's beyond me, and I've been pushing for audit rights, and I know a lot of other people have been pushing for audit rights, that when you um, operate under a Section 115 license, there is no provision to allow you to even check to see if what you got paid is accurate. It relies on what they call a certified statement of account, which is, is basically the, the digital service is hiring their own auditor to confirm the accuracy of the statement they've prepared. And, and you can't hire your own auditor. No. It's their auditor. It's their auditor. And all they do Got is it. they say that this statement is accurate. And you don't even, when you, when you look at this certification, you're saying to yourself, they, all they're saying is what's on the statement, you know, two plus two equals four. That looks right. You know, I don't believe they're going upstream to confirm if all of the uh, performances, the views are all being logged to see if they come down in the statement. I don't think that's happening. I don't think that whatever certifications are happening that's going beyond looking at the statement. So it, it's crazy that the Section 115 licenses are such, you know, in such great use that nobody can conduct an audit uh, under these licenses that are issued. And, and that to me is, is one of the biggest- well, how, how's, how's that gonna change? Is it gonna take somebody to uh, a lawsuit to, to force that to change is it going to take i think i think it's only by an act of congress is is how that will work um i think that they have to amend uh the act to put in an audit right now not to get you know too technical but section 114 is what the sound exchange uh licenses fall under mm -hmm. and there's an audit and there's an audit right so that those services who operate under those licenses under Section 114 are subject to audit. And I just don't know what's so difficult about doing a copy paste job of the provisions that work fine in Section 114 and to put them in Section 115. It gets talked about, but it's not been happening. And in the who meantime, would be opposed to it? What's that? Who would be opposed to it? Um, well, people, that are taking to... people that are taking advantage of it. Yeah, better for better for Michael to answer that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's how. I mean that's what I would see, and I don't know who those people would be, but you know, the person who's hiring their own auditor to verify their own accounting statement. You know, hey, two, it, right now it says two plus two, when the reality is it should be eight plus eight. Well, there's that's the, right. there's the be. person who's not going to like it. That's right. I mean, it's just. I mean, you think about all forms of uh, deals in the marketplace, music, non-music. You know, you tend to have a right to confirm if you're getting paid right, and it's just remarkable that in this particular case, and with streaming services, interactive, non-interactive, taking such advantage of Section 115 um, without having to go direct for a license, you know, to a music publisher, you'd think they'd have an audit right, and they don't. So That's you, one of the. You, you would think it would be in great advantage to just the, the the record labels to say we want that change because that's money that's potentially coming into them why i don't know maybe they are why aren't they flexing their muscle with congress to say this has to change we need you to make this change government well just as a technical note on that if this isn't a record label issue this is a music publisher issue so they would be the ones okay. who would have to risk and but i still, believe they those did. are big organizations 
they are, and they and I understand they've been raising it. I just don't know, and I'm not, you know, behind the curtain enough to know uh, somewhere else. You know, why is the audit right not making it into Section 115? I know it gets proposed. I know it gets talked about. Um, it's, it's just not been there. Got it. So, what are your goals with with Crunch Digital? What What do you hope to accomplish going forward with with Crunch? Um. We want to be that bridge between all the content users and all of the content owners that helps to facilitate licensing and revenue flow. We want folks to be able to come to us and maybe say, here's 5,000 or 10,000 tracks that I want to use. Help facilitate me getting the licenses done. And in a very smart and clean way, um, we help get those licenses done. We help get the reporting off to the publishers. And it's a win-win for everybody because the, the music apps in particular, they don't need to build a back office to handle their reporting. Uh, the publishers are happy because they're getting their reports in a, in a format that they want. Revenue is tight. Um, the relationships are good. Because remember, back in the Section 115 licensing that was talked about, I can't imagine that you have you know, a great relationship with a publisher. Imagine... I want to reach out to this publisher because I want to run this promotion. And the, and the publisher sitting there saying, aren't you the same folks who like basically you know, gave me a compulsory license and I can't audit you when you could have come to me and we could have had a direct conversation and now you want me to like approve some sort of you know, promotion that doesn't fit under the license? So we want to help you know, make better relationships. Yeah. But ultimately, yeah. ultimately, we'd like to see Crunch Digital – as an authoritative, authoritative private database that everybody can utilize to help facilitate more commerce, uh, less friction, less litigation, and see the money flow. And right now, you know, we've got so much buy-in from major publishers and a lot of independent publishers. You know, um, we'll get there. I mean, it's uh, um, it, it's going nicely, and uh, you know, I'd love to see Crunch as just being. You know, you start a music service. And in the conversation, back to Michael, your question about the VC, the, the VC saying, this is great. Have you, are you working yet with Crunch to make sure you've all the rights and handling the reporting? Right. And, and to be honest with you, you know, we don't have to be the only ones. You know, I think it's better if it's us and maybe you know, two or three other companies that are like us. Um, and let us just differentiate ourselves, differentiate ourselves on customer service. Sure, sure. So, so Keith, you know, Keith, where where can where can people find more info on Crunch Digital online? Uh, just crunchdigital.com. Thank you for asking. That's the uh, that's the place to go. You get more information. You go to the site. People can send an email and ask questions. Um, every day we get some good questions like, uh, "Hi, I have this great app, and I'm planning to use the Beatles songs uh, in it." And what I don't could go wrong. That, yeah, what could go wrong? That, yeah, what could go wrong? Uh, I can't seem to get the licenses. I'm only gonna, you know, maybe have about you know five thousand usages in March. Do you think anybody will care? And you know, and all you can do is write back yes. Yes. You know, this yeah. is a problem. Uh, but uh, yes, you know, we love to talk to folks. Uh, and again, our role is to. Uh, uh, just really try to facilitate revenue because it's not necessarily that licensing is broken, like you hear, you know, often uh, said. It's just you need to have all the right tools in place to make it, you know, a, a more prosperous marketplace and, and see the money flow. Yeah, it's a complicated area for those who aren't, uh, you know, knowledgeable about it. Um, and it's, I think it's important to have someone you can go to to help navigate those waters. So uh, I, I think it's awesome. You know, I, I think it's, you know, you had alluded to it early in the conversation, Jay, of just do it now and apologize later. I don't think this is one of those cases where that works all that well because a yeah. lot of times your apology is you're out of business. Yeah. So and, there, only, and maybe hit with a fine or yeah. <laughs> prison time. Well, yeah. Well, in, you know, infringement is... Uh, you know, Seriously. a lot of money for each infringing, uh, you know, use. But, you know, there, like I said, there's seems like there's thousands of apps out there that are using music. And, you know, if one or two or three, you know, get shut down, as you just described, you know, that's what's going to happen because there's somebody right behind them wow. that, wants to do, that wants to do it the right way. Yeah. Right, right. 
Very good. This was an awesome conversation, Keith. This was like this this was this was deep. There's a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge here. Well, you know, and it is deep, and I think like Jay was saying, that it, it intimidates a lot of folks, and it's really not that bad if you're working with the right uh, people. Um, and by the way, I've, I've heard great things about your, uh, your podcast here, and I also noticed that uh, you can find it on YouTube and there's advertising. Does that mean that a guest gets a share? <laughs> no. <laughs> or like a, just a whole new can of worms that we should just No, but a whole new can of worms. Yeah, talk to, talk to, you, talk to YouTube place. about that. <laughs> right, you know, we, that's funny. I, I, we would love to, you know, have you on again. There's, there's so many different elements of this to, I mean, I would love to have like a, uh, you know, digital rights 101 discussion at some point. There, there's so many layers to this onion, but um, we really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us. No, for sure. I enjoyed it. By the way, I just thought of it. Um, the California Copyright Conference on um, November 17th here in L.A. is having a panel call, called, I think, What's App and Music? And it's a panel about music apps and licensing. Um, and I'm on the panel. Uh, that, wasn't oh, great. A plug. that wasn't a plug, but I was just thinking on the subject matter. For those that are in L.A., it might be something at the California Copyright Conference that they should go attend. Are Where's you? that at? Go ahead. Where is uh, Studio City, California? They can Google it. Uh, by by chance, are you coming up next week to um, SF Music Tech? Not this year. Not this, this year. This, and I've heard this could be the last year for it too. There's really? been rumors that they're they're gonna put it. I to wanted bed. to go. I had a conflict. Yeah. I really wanted to go. Yeah, I, I yeah I do realize if I was you know attending more that attendance would spike but uh you know i'm just kidding but but but, uh, but a lot of what what we discussed here is is right at home at sf music tech as well i mean there's a lot of a lot of startups a lot of vc there's a lot of smart people there that are that are trying to figure out the ways to do it what i think i'd like to see happen and maybe it's something that you know crunch digital sponsors but there needs to be like a symposium um of app developers, just, just, you know, like what you're talking about, but app developers and talk to them about the ins and the outs of the music industry. Yes. Something Michael, you were talking about a few minutes ago about VCs. There's no harm in inviting them to, and just have a whole schmooze fest of talking through, you know, the challenges and, and how to do it right at the ground level. Yeah. A yeah. couple years ago, I won't name, name the app, but I, I knew somebody who was developing a, a radio type app. And they said afterwards, they're like, you know, if if I knew what was involved, I would have never done this. They go the 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 hoops, the legal stuff, everything that you've got to go through to acquire these licenses legally is just um, incredible. That that they had no nobody no as you said nobody's laid this out up front to say, well, here's what you're up against. Well, you just touched on something which might be part two of a podcast, but, you know, just to say something to that, which I think is very important, is you have a lot of companies who are trying to do the right thing. They're doing the right licensing. They're getting their backing. They're, going, they're, they're doing it all the way you're supposed to do it. And I know what frustrates them is they'll see somebody else come along who launches. Who's not doing that. Who's not doing it. I mean, this is any business industry where there's certain rules put in place and then somebody doesn't follow the rules, and the person not following the rules is getting traction, you know, getting and rewarded be, for it. And they're getting rewarded, and they've become a competitor, and it frustrates uh, companies who have tried to do it the right way. So I think that the reason you might see even some companies that might have tried to do it the right way typically maybe aren't even putting the effort in because they're feeling like, well, why should I? This right. other company, this other company isn't going through the hoops, and nothing's happening to them. But at some point, somebody's going to get sued and sued really bad, you know, yeah. for not following the rules. And, and, and then, you know, folks might say, OK, maybe it's not such a good idea for me <laughs> yeah. to, like, you know, bypass things that I know better should, you know, shouldn't have been bypassed. Right, right, right. Keith, again, this was awesome. I, I thank you so much for sitting down and joining us on this. Thank you. Absolutely. It was a lot really of fun. appreciate it. I look forward to connecting again. Yeah, definitely. Right. Take care. All right. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye. That was a deep conversation, man. You wow. know, I, 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 you know, I, I, I hope everybody stuck through to the end.
because I'm imagining there's there's some 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 listeners and some artists who are like I don't know what this is and I don't does it even pertain to me? But in the end, yes, it does. It pertains to every Absolutely single does. musician, artist, performer out there. And yeah, um, you need to educate yourself on these things, and it's it's so important, like you say. And and maybe uh, you know a, a good step would be to take a look at their you know Crunch's website and and do some research on your own. But it is very important. Um, and Keith was, you know, we have coffee once in a while and we have these great conversations. And he was saying that a lot of it isn't, you know, nefarious. It's not that some of these right. companies are out to try to get you. It's just something that you mentioned during the, the podcast, Michael. And that is that this stuff has been around like a week and a half. Right. And they it's just new. don't know. They don't know. You know, we're, not- we're, a lot of these developers as I mentioned, are not coming from the music industry. And that's, that's right. good. That's healthy. That's I how, believe it is. That's how we get new yeah. and exciting developments and ideas. But yeah. that also means they don't know all of the hoops, they don't know what all they don't of the know. hurdles that are out there. And at, at some point in time, they're going to have to address those hurdles. And it would be nice to have a way for these developers to go, all right, what 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 is ahead of me here? If I want if I want a license, if I want a library of thirty million songs, what do I have to be able to do? Right. Not just to play it, but to report what's been played and to pay what's been played and to, you know, all all of that that goes along with it. Um, you know, I just don't think a lot of these developers. I'm sure as time moves forward here, more and more of them are are aware of it, just because it becomes part of their culture mm-hmm. now. But you know, the kid in a dorm room who just, the kid in the he? dorm room who wanted to invent Napster had no clue. No. He just wanted to do something cool to share music with his friends. That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's still the, that still's what's driving so much development is, I just want to do something cool with my buddy, with my friends, mm-hmm. and they're not thinking about the legal ramifications. Right. Of it. And and how could they? I mean, it, it, there's so many layers to it. You it's very shouldn't. complicated. You almost shouldn't. Yeah, I think that's where the great strides in uh, innovation are going to come from. Are those kids in the dorm room who aren't saddled by um, you know all of these rules and regulations? Because at the end of the day, if you're working for a music company, some of these things are a non-starter with you. Like you had mentioned that company that if they had known you know today all of the things that were involved. And that's why I think it's so important for companies like Crunch or, or, or whoever to simplify this process. And I believe it will be going forward because we're still in its infancy, right? I mean, so th- much, this, yeah. So I, I think we can help guide the conversation and the people listening and viewing can help guide this conversation. And going forward, you know, there will be some easier solutions and we're going to look back at this time as gosh, can you imagine how hard it was? Wild, this is the Wild West. I mean, if you thought when Napster launched it was the Wild West, we are still Wild West right now. And yeah. and 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 I think to your point, educate yourself. At at the end of the day, that's what's the most important. Whether you're an artist, a developer, whoever, just educate yourself even to the littlest bit. Don't do not. Let me repeat, do not buy into the media hype and the and the print stories that say this service is screwing this artist and this publisher is pissed at this service and this app is stealing yeah. the money. Don't buy into that because that's not it's not the full story. It's not the full story. Educate yourself to understand what's going on even a little bit behind the scenes and all of a sudden you're going to have a a greater appreciation for what people are trying to do. And, and what they're hoping to accomplish and yeah. and you you won't you won't jump off the deep end and say that's it I'm pulling all my music off the digital services because Taylor Swift is pissed well yeah to educate yourself before yeah you you're, you're not hearing the whole story you're not hearing I, the whole I couldn't story. I couldn't agree with you more yeah. good show good all right guys that's it till next week I think we've got some guests coming up I don't know if they're confirmed but we've got two or three guests coming up soon here yeah all right guys that's it take care